It's an absolutely wild day in the world of Magic the Gathering. Wizards of the Coast has just said they're discontinuing both set boosters and draft boosters and replacing them with the mysterious new play boosters. Magic. I am a wizard. History. I'm an old wizard. The magic historian. My bones hurt. Greetings, owners of fine luxury cardboard rectangles. My friends, I hope the day finds you well because we have gathered for a totally crazy installment of mega magic news. I didn't think the news of today was going to be, oh, hey, set boosters and draft boosters are going away. Yesterday, we were talking about what's going to get banned today. And the answer is nothing. For anybody who's wondering, the ban announcement said nothing was changed. But hey, by the way, why don't you go check out this link where we talk about play boosters and the fact that set and draft boosters are going away. So I went, whoa, hold on, what's going on? I clicked on that link, started reading it. My mind started to explode. I actually went straight down to the LGS because I'm like, I got to talk to somebody about this. And on that note, I want to say thank you guys for being here. It's super fun to have a ton of people who enjoy the same hobby, who are excited to get together and talk about all the news because this is wild, right? It shows that in some ways Wizard's strategy with changing boosters was successful, but in other ways it was a dismal failure. So what we're going to do is there's a huge article up over on the Wizards of the Coast website. We're going to go through part of it here but it's so big that the rest of it we're going to talk about in a live stream over on my Hatcher YouTube channel later today so I'll leave a link to that at the end of the video and down in the comments for you to check out but a lot of what Rosewater has to say here is really eye-opening and some of the language that he uses he's never spoken like this about magic before and it really does give you an idea of what's going on internally so Basically, they start out by talking about the story goes back to 2018. This is Studio X was birthed around then, right? This is the company. This is what the company calls the part of Wizards that works specifically on tabletop magic. I don't know why they gave it the name Studio X. Maybe because they think it sounds cool. I mean, they just renamed Twitter to everything is X now. But anyhow, basically, they crunch a whole bunch of data about what players enjoy about magic and what doesn't work for them. So it says, occasionally, we find a piece of data that causes us to rethink how we make magic. This time, the piece of data was the following. The majority of players who open a booster do not play a limited format with it, draft or sealed. So we thought there might be a different kind of booster that was more fun to open if we weren't restricted by the needs of limited play. And this is what led to the creation of the set booster. Now, this is an interesting assumption because if you look at it, you go, okay, well, the more people who open the packs aren't playing limited with it, but the real question becomes how many packs are those people getting? If 80% of your audience buys booster packs not caring about using it for limited, but the 20% that cares about limited buy way more, then this is actually a really foolish move, right? And the fact that Wizards, basically, they reaped what they sowed with this one, right? Ultimately, the set boosters succeeded in ways they weren't anticipating because they didn't really think it all through. So, basically, at that point, they bring up the set boosters. Draft boosters are what they start to call the original boosters. Then collector boosters, it says here, toss those to the side for now because we're not talking about collector boosters. Those are going to remain the same. Set boosters were a wild success. Players enjoyed the opportunity to get multiple rares, having a guaranteed foil slot, having an opportunity to open a card from the list, getting an art card, etc. We made a booster that was more fun to open, and the audience clearly voiced they'd prefer to purchase that. So much so that it started causing some problems, which we'll now go through. Now, I want to point out here something, because they just like to go, hey, set boosters got really successful, and that was a problem. But they pushed for this. Remember that. Originally, when set boosters came along, all of a sudden, they had production issues. They were like, hey, you know, we can't get you draft boosters out in time for the release, but we can get you as many set booster boxes as you want, and the bundles get changed to set boosters. Like, basically, it's like that gladiator scene where Buddy gets jorked, jork jorked in the chest, put the armor plate over him, except the draft boosters weren't strong enough to win the fight in the first place. So set boosters just stood there. Wizards like, everybody loves set boosters. It's like you rigged, you rigged the game against us a bit. Now, Problem one, set boosters eclipsed draft boosters. Surprise! 
Set boosters became the top choice for players. And I should stress, not by a little, but significantly. Now this data can be somewhat skewed because like I said, they pushed set boosters down our throats. They became the de facto. But anyways, this means that when most players had a choice of what to buy, they were opting to buy set boosters. The problem is that set boosters are not designed for limited play. So for example, if a store only had set boosters in stock, they couldn't run drafts. Some of our smaller markets don't have the option of printing two different types of boosters, so they had to pick one. Because set boosters sold better, they chose them. This meant, though, that no drafts or games of sealed could be played in those markets. Many players have tried to use set boosters for limited play with being their only option, but because they're not designed for limited, it results in significantly substandard limited play. If you don't know, set boosters are designed in a way where the commons and uncommons in the pack, they're all supposed to fit different themes. So you'll find, oh, these three guys are vampires, or these three guys like to, you know, hug goats out behind farms, whatever it is, there would be a connection. And they had this kind of experience that they wanted to give you with set boosters. But that makes it so that it's terrible for draft and obviously terrible for all forms of limited. So they ended up with an issue where, okay, well, we're not going to have people carrying as many draft booster boxes because you'll go to a shop and you'll see they have picked either all set boosters or all draft boosters. Like only the biggest players can go, yeah, we carry it all. We've got every booster of every type, only the mega stores. And even those stores are having a hard time keeping up with what's going on with wizards, right? So, problem number two, it causes inventory problems. This is a bit simplified, but here's how a store manages magic product. Oh, I already guessed dived into that. They buy product A and sell it. They use money to buy product B. They sell product B and use the money to buy product C. If for some reason they don't sell of a product, it gets stuck in their inventory, meaning it isn't converted into money to buy the next product. If this happens enough, it causes huge problems for stores. Note, this basic concept also is true for distributors, the companies that buy magic from us and sell it to the stores. The fact that Rosewater is getting down into this specific aspect of it means that like, he is not like the highest level individual of the company, right? He's not top, pop, part of the big top corporate dogs. He basically is the face of magic. He's part of design and all that, but he doesn't get to make decisions. And you can tell by reading what he says, basically what's going on with the company kind of bleeds into the way that he thinks. And a lot of it is about economics. So the whole, you sell this set, then you buy the next set. So it would be like, imagine the three block structure. You get the first set in the Mirrodin block, then the, the next two. So you sell the first set Mirrodin, that gives you the money to get Dark Steel. You sell Dark Steel, that gives you the money to get Fifth Dawn. But Wizards has cranked up production on top of having multiple iterations of every product, right? So it says, once upon a time, a store just had to buy one booster for any type of magic set. So that's what they bought. Now every set releases with both set boosters and draft boosters. Most of the customers prefer set boosters, but limited play, which fosters community and can be additional income for a store, requires draft boosters. How much do you get of each? Get too many set boosters and not enough draft boosters, you can't run limited events, which costs the store money. Oh, that problem kind of sorted itself out because there's few, fewer people seeking limited, and that's part of what Wizards has realized there. They have made some big mistakes. Get too many draft boosters, not enough set boosters. You run on what the customer wants to buy, which also costs you money. When I was down at the LGS today, as fate would have it, somebody came in to buy Wilds of Eldraine, looking at set booster, collector boosters, and regular draft boosters. Ask what the difference was, how many different packs per box. So literally saw it in the first place, like firsthand happening just today, where people are like, okay, they still don't 100% know what's what, but ultimately guess what the choice was? Set boosters right? So problem number three, it began the abandonment of draft boosters. The second problem exacerbated the first problem. Having two different types of boosters was causing strain and stores were opting to buy set boosters. This came at the expense of limited play. But if this was the cost of staying in business, that's what they had to do. Yeah, yes. We do a lot of future forecasting in Studio X and our people were saying that given enough time, they believed draft boosters would stop being a thing. The market didn't really want two types of core boosters. Draft boosters are entirely unexciting compared to set boosters. If you're not doing a limited event, they don't have the same pop. So clearly they're just gonna lose, right? Limited play, especially draft, is a huge part of the magic ecosystem. Ecosystem, not ecosystem. As I explained above, it's an important part of in-store activity. It's a big driver for building community. Our pre-releases use limited play as a way for players to sample the set. It's a key part of keeping players with the game long term. 
Our data shows the longer you play, the more likely limited is a large part of your play experience. This used to be how it was. You go down to the game store, you play in a standard event, something like that. Well, guess what? After the event ends, we're all drafting. And if there's still time, we're doing another draft. We're closing this place out. We're here to play magic. And limited offers a completely different experience. So you have these people who are like, yo, everybody here is buying three packs ahead to play in this event, right? Plus, we do it another time, that's three packs ahead. Not like commander players, where they come in and buy a couple packs hoping, hey, maybe I'll get something cool from my commander, otherwise I'm just gonna buy some singles, right? So ultimately, you don't have the same drive to push those booster packs. And you can see, like Wizards of the Coast has lost a bunch of long-term players. There has been an exodus of old school players because Wizards has been doing short-term snatch and grab maneuvers. Now, it says one of the key strengths of Magic is there's many ways to enjoy it. Limited play might not be how many players interact with the game, but for the millions of players who play Limited, it's fundamental to their enjoyment. Seeing draft boosters and thus Limited play disappear would be a big problem for players and stores. Wizards wants that money, right? Problem four, it causes confusion in the marketplace. Well, that makes perfect sense. You can't just go in and grab whatever booster box. It's pretty straightforward. Overall, you're going to go, oops, you know what? It even says here, Rosewater even says, there's multiple occasions where he went to open a booster to play limited only to realize he was accidentally opening a set booster. So this goes beyond players. Stories of stores ordering one type of booster and getting another because the distributors get confused or whatever else. So, and basically it also means Wizards has to communicate stuff twice as, as much. They have to go, this is what's in this set, this is what's in this set, this is what's in this set, with those big old crazy charts. So it says that as well. It says it makes some magic boosters less desirable. Yeah, I w wonder which one those are, right? It's pretty much like in most situations it's going to be the draft boosters, but then you're going to have draft players who want draft boosters and you only got the set boosters. So there's just, it, it, goes, it goes across multiple levels like that. Now, every booster buyer wasn't getting all the cool stuff. This is a big one. This is a big one where basically when you boil it down, when they come with all the cool card treatments, the answer became, where do I get this card? The only place you can't get it is draft boosters. So they made draft boosters the like shop of nothingness, attempting to eclipse them with set boosters. And then they realized, yo, 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 we need draft boosters to sell limited stuff. People aren't playing. People aren't going out to standard. We're not able to sell this product. We've got to extend standard out by 50%, right? Like we've got to make it 50% longer by adding a whole nother year to it, right? So it says, because set boosters were the more popular item, decided to approach the problem by figuring out how to make set boosters playable. The major issues identified were there weren't enough cards in the booster pack. So 12 cards plus an art card is not enough for the draft format. The other issue that they had is the colors aren't balanced across all five because like I said, they had themes. Some of the themes would be, here's vampires. Some of the themes would be, here's five red cards that are thematically tied together. So that messes the draft experience up. On top of that, there's cards that don't fit into themes very well. So you don't end up seeing them in set boosters that also chase turn to certain chase uncommons being impossible to get your hands on because they weren't in those themes. So they weren't in set boosters. So they weren't getting open in reasonable numbers, right? So the next issue is the ratio of rarities would have to shift. So this is talking about how with draft boosters, you get one rare. With set boosters, you get one to four rares. So they want to basically maintain that. An interesting one is number four. They'd have to change how they made sets. It says how we design sets is heavily influenced by the means we package it in boosters. So changing the ASVAN of rarities, that is the count of each rarity of cards you'd expect to see when you open a booster, introducing more variants and slots, adding in more outside cards, all impact how the set plays and requires us to change how we build the set. Of all changes, this was the biggest. It required us to rethink how a magic set is made. R&D spent a lot of time on this, and I'll get more into the nitty gritty of this when they get into previews for Murders at Karlov Manor. That's when we're gonna see this changeover. And I'm interested to hear more because some of the stuff that he talks about here, he talks about e concepts like EV, expected value. He talks about the ratio of rares to dollars that you get from packs. These are not what we would normally see, right? So this has led to the birth of play boosters. Play boosters are going to be 14 card booster packs. So the first six cards in the pack will be commons, right? The seventh slot will either be a common or a list card. So one out of eight packs will have a list card. Now the list is a little bit weirder. So basically the list is going to include special guests 
which are 10 cards that are exciting reprints according to them, which we've seen before. But it's unclear whether that's being added into the previous list and we're getting this huge thing, or whether the list is just 10 special reprints. That part is not 100% obvious to me. I can't really tell, but they do have a list special guest variant. Then you've got slots 8 to 10 for 3 uncommons, and then you have the mythic rare or rare slot, then you have a land slot, and then you have a slot for a non-foil wild card that can be anything from the main set, and any rarity, and any booster fun, because they're still doing booster fun. And then you've got traditional foil wild card in slot number 14, and then the 15th slot is basically either a ad insert, a token, or an art card. I'm glad they're keeping the art cards because I actually really like them, but I would have understood if they axed them because, eh, not everyone likes them. So the breakdown goes like this. 65% chance of getting a token or an ad insert, 30% or an art card, 5% art card with signature. So basically one out of every three will be an art card, which is all right with me. So the way it varies from a set booster, you get two more playable cards, there's no more connection between the commons or uncommons. Minus one non-foil wild card. Minus one non-playable object, which is what they call the ads and art insert, that kind of stuff. And a one in three opportunity of the art set card. Difference from draft booster, minus one playable card, minus three commons, plus one non-foil wild card, plus one traditional foil wild card, and then the opportunity of getting a card from the list. So overall, this is essentially like a, a modified set booster, obviously, that has going to 14 cards instead of 15. Wizards says something specifically, this is a huge article, so I'm not sure exactly where it's listed, but they say something about how the, they had a common complaint was that there's too many like junk cards in packs, but at the same time, they talk about how they would make unplayable cards for limited in boosters before and how that's changing. So like I said, this article is huge. There's a lot to unpack. The play boosters are going to be the same price as set boosters, and that's what's gonna get used for drafts and things like that going forward. So basically, there's gonna be an increase in the price of drafting in Magic overall. If you were somebody who just wanted draft packs, well, now you gotta move up to set booster packs, right? So drafts are gonna go up by, at least where I am right now, about 30%, and that's a crazy increase. And then you have the fact as well that the booster boxes are going to a uniform 36 because that's what's better for draft environments. So as a result, you have the scenario where Wizards is going 36, but they're at set booster prices. So you're getting a few more cards. It's a little bit of a tweak up from set boosters. It's a tweak down from draft boosters, but this is really good for smaller game stores. Bigger game stores may not care. It's, it's good to not have to manage as many different pieces of inventory. And draft boosters really were gonna become extinct because of Wizards' own designs. Like they're really reaping what they sowed here overall in terms of they wanted to go, everybody go on arena. We're not really gonna do that much to support in-store standard or people playing standard. We're not really gonna worry about the limited environment because they were designing magic sets to kind of burst. It, it changed from magic sets that were designed for standard and limited play into magic sets that were designed to try and push cards into modern, commander, legacy, vintage, all these formats, right? That's what they wanted to do with it. And the commons and uncommons were just, and the draft limited stuff was an excuse and Arena obviously got a little more attention that way in terms of people would still be drafting on Arena. But Wizards of the Coast basically drove a lot of the competitive players out of game stores. And this caused damage to standard. This caused damage to the overall drafting environment, limited environment. Wizards of the Coast knowing that, hey, wait, when people stick around longer, they keep buying more and more and more. Ultimately, I lay this at the feet of the philosophy where Wizards went, everything is about Commander. Let's get everything we can. We're gonna focus on just making it casual, pulling as much as we can from the Commander players. But ultimately, it's been just another of their short-sighted decisions that have led to long-term damage to Magic. Now, the direction they're taking now where they're bringing back standard play, this introduction of play boosters to smooth things out and to help limit it overall is a big step in the right direction. Will it be enough? I don't know. We've seen a mass exodus of players from the game as of late. So I'm hopeful that we are now on the road to mending the game. This is obviously 
huge news. The article is gigantic. I'm going to go through the whole thing in a live stream tonight. Link here at the end of the video and down in the description. Big thank you to my patrons for supporting my channel. You guys rule. And like I said at the beginning, thanks for coming by to talk about magic with me. Having a great time. I'll see you all either for the next video or tonight for the live stream.